Hi, if you don't know me, my name is Caleb Goggins. I am a fine artist. I'm a painter and a sculptor. I am here in my Signal Mountain studio. If you've never seen an artist studio, I wanted to give you a tour. And also for you, those artists out there who are interested in getting out painting on location or maybe working in your home uh, while we're kind of cooped up during all of this COVID uh, quarantine situation. I wanted to give you, show you what things are like here in the studio and then also show you what uh, what I take when I'm painting on location or taking a small kit somewhere to work. So I'm give you a tour around the studio. Right over here is my easel in front of some nice north lights. This is a sculpture um, that I created for the National Medal of Honor Museum here in Chattanooga, along with seven, six, excuse me, six other heads. So uh, this is my primary easel. It's a Hughes easel. Here are a bunch of pieces of artwork uh, in progress, studies. This is my computer workstation. You can see it's uh, a little messy. Uh, in that uh, cabinet, I have my printer and supplies and a coat rack. These are some paintings, most of them, uh, all the small ones, painted on location over the years. Uh, I like to have a nice seating area for myself to relax for when I have... Um, receptions and or just clients and uh, and people over some other paintings back there over here on the end I have a nice workbench where I can uh, work on framing and getting things uh, settled there's a nice there's a big painting up there that is one of my favorites from over the years uh, the the plastic bags you see are the clay sculptures for the museum in their wrappings keep them moist so that is my studio. First up, let's take a look at everything I keep in my mobile painting kit and why. Uh, of course, I have a backpack, and then these are the various things that I carry with me. So I'll show you what each of those are. I use my painting kit primarily for going out and plein air painting, um, going on location for when I have commissions, whether that is a portrait or anything else, because I really want to capture uh, what's happening and what I'm experiencing, what I'm seeing in person. I want to put that down in visual form, the way I see it when I'm there, so that I can take that back to the studio and work from that uh, on something larger. So I'm going to show you each of the, the things that I have and, and also why. Because my priorities for a mobile painting kit are that it's small, light, and compact, that it has everything that I need and nothing that I don't hopefully. So, without further ado, uh, the first thing is some form of easel or painting box. This is a painting box that I made a number of years ago. It holds the panels up here. It attaches to a tripod via a shoe on the back. It has all this wonderful room for, for um, a good palette of paints and mixing surface. And uh, this, these uh, clips up here hold the panel. This clip holds a thing of turp. And next, so I'll move on. Also, of course, you need a tripod. This is a full-size tripod. Um, it raises the, the level of my, uh, my painting box up as high as I could want it. And it is very light and compact. Of course, brushes. In this case, I keep them presently in this bamboo and cloth organizer. These are the brushes. I'll show you what the brushes are and, and why I have the brushes that I do. I'll show you that in a little bit. Something to hold the paints that you need, your backup paints. If I'm really wanting to, to, to keep cut down the amount of stuff that I'm carrying, I can lay these out on my palette and just make sure I have plenty and carry them in my box all closed up and then uh, hopefully not need any extra. Some kind of brush cleaning jar to hold solvents. I typically have a little bottle with some extra solvent. I prefer Gamsol. It is uh, it does an ex excellent job thinning paints, cleaning off your palette, cleaning your brushes and it evaporates quickly without having um, a lot of smell and a lot of noxious fumes that you're breathing in. 
Two more things that are very important. A refuse bag for used up rags and paper towels. Uh, some people like uh, regular actual cloth rags, but I, I prefer paper towels. Of course, something to carry it all in. I use this backpack. It could be considerably smaller, um, about half the size and still carry everything that I need. Some form, of some form of panel carrier, something that you are going to carry your paintings in to and from the location. This is one that I made. So I can carry uh, a number of panels and they're divided and kept separate so that uh, the paint doesn't get rubbed off onto each other or just make a mess. I usually carry different size panels and ones that are toned different, um, different tones. So this one you see is yellow, the other one was kind of a reddish violet. Last is something that you may not need um, if you're painting in full daylight. Uh, but if you like to paint evening or nocturne scenes, or you're going to be painting indoors and need some extra light, a studio light can be very, very helpful. And of course, the, ad the appropriate battery source. Take a look at my palette and let you see what I keep on my palette. Uh, this is very close to what I use in my studio. Um, I can limit this if I want to to smaller pigments, numbers of pigments, and we'll talk about that a little bit. My palette is based on a warm and cool of each primary with a few additions that I find very helpful. So I have a Alizarin Crimson that's a very cool violet red, a medium red. Uh, that could be any number of medium reds. In this case, it's a cadmium red deep. Then I have cadmium red light, which functions as an orange and or a something to modulate my other reds. Next over is cadmium, red, cadmium yellow, medium or deep. That's my hot, my warm yellow. Next is Indian yellow. It's transparent. I use it as far as hue is concerned, much the same way I use the cadmium yellow, but it's extremely transparent. Uh, it's important to note also that the cadmium reds are also very opaque and the, and the alizarin crimson is very, very transparent. Next over, I have yellow ochre and raw sienna. Those are essentially in how I fun they function on my palette as two different values of the same, of the same color. Uh, of course, raw sienna is just a little bit redder. Um, Next over, I have sap green. Sap green functions as one of three pigments that I use, primary pigments that I use, to mix my darks. I use alizarin crimson, sap green, and ultramarine blue um, as the basis for all my darks. Uh, sap green is also wonderful for modulating and shifting other mixtures and hues. Next over is viridian. Also wonderful for mixing flesh tones. I'm making different kinds of violets and greens and turquoise. Next is um, cerulean blue. It is a fairly low tinting strength, warm blue. Then cobalt blue. It's as far as hue is concerned. It's it's right in the middle, uh, but it's a bit lighter in value than the last two blues. My workhorse blue is uh, ultramarine. I use it a lot. I can, I can um, do a lot of things by adding white to it. I can use it in my darks. Um, it's, it's just a wonderful pigment. It's semi-transparent. Uh, and the last blue that I have in my palette is thalocyanine. And it is extremely dark and extremely transparent and also an extremely strong, high tinting strength, aggressive color. Um, so pigment. So I really don't want to use that unless I absolutely need it to push a dark that much darker to make really high chroma violets or teals or greens. And I also have trans red oxide, uh, which I use for mixing all, all manner of earth tones and flesh tones and shifting other colors. Um, it's a really, really wonderful, useful pigment. And then my primary medium that I use most is oleogel from Natural Pigments. 
As far as the, the, the manufacturer on pigments, I have just about everything in my drawers. Um, as long as it's a good, high-quality artist pigment and it behaves the way you want it to, that's the important thing. As far as a container, a box to whatever whatever container works for you. This is a cigar box that I've put a magnetic clasp on it. Um, it's just the right size and it's the right shape. But it holds paints that I that I need and want, and it's what I like. Uh, your refuse bag and paper towels, whatever paper towel you like using best. And then I prefer a cloth bag because it allows uh, the it allows the 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 paper towels, especially if I'm if I'm working over the course of a day, um, that might have gotten a little bit saturated with um, your odorless mineral spirits in the paint. It allows those to breathe and actually start drying. Um, and I find it easier to work with the kind of heavier canvas bag than the uh, the floppy flimsy trash bags or or grocery sacks that tend to get broken and tear and uh, they leak it just can be a mess I find this much much more manageable for dealing with odorless mineral spirits I really like these uh, brush cleaning cans or metal jars uh, they have the brush cleaner and a brush holder or something to wipe wipe the odorless mineral spirits off. I highly encourage you to get one that has three clasps. The ones with two clasps usually do not seal well enough to actually keep uh, you from making a mess. They'll they'll leak into your bag and just it's gets a gets a, a bit of a nightmare. Uh, this is a Nalgene. I believe it's a four ounce bottle. Um, I think it's four ounce. But anyway, it's, it's a Nalgene bottle. Uh, it's, it's HDPE, so it's uh, safe to use with mineral spirits. It's what I use for my extra mineral spirits. Panels and panel carriers. Not sure if you can see this or not, but down in here, these dividers mean that I can take panels and place them back to back and it only touches the edges of the painting. So whatever I paint on this, the majority of that image is completely protected. And once you install it, if it's in a, a paint, a, a frame uh, that covers the, a bit of the edge, that part of the painting that will be slightly influenced is not going to matter. And if you present it with a float frame, it usually there's, there's things aren't so precise and so perfect in field studies um, or on location paintings. Uh, that that bit of life and bit of um, movement around the edges um, is detrimental. Uh, so this, um, put this back together here. This the one that I made myself can be just a little fiddly, but it's not bad at all. Go ahead and slide this together. Get my finger out of the way. And then Velcro holds it together. And I can travel with this and it protects. I can travel with this and it protects the panels. Uh, this is a tripod um, that I got off of eBay. I think it's about $75. It's a really, really great deal. Uh, one more thing that I have in here that I'm forgetting about. This is a windscreen, uh, not windscreen, um, light diffuser setup uh, that I built. There's two different sizes of it. Um, if you want to learn how to do these um, and use these effectively, uh, look up James Gurney's uh, blog and information. He actually has a wonderful video on how to make wonderful light, light diffusers for different setups. This is the tripod. It, uh, it opens up and gets as big as the tripod that my camera is standing on, all the way up as tall as I need it. And it only weighs three pounds. Brushes. This is a big topic, brushes. I come around here so I can look at them. I primarily use flats and some filberts or long uh, rigger type brushes, uh, but I really like flats because I can, 
I can shift how I hold the brush, whether it's slightly on the edge, all the way on the edge, or pulled along the flat front edge of the brush and get a whole wide variety of marks. I really like um, long flats because they have a little bit more articulation, um, a little bit, little bit more larger variety in the marks, and they hold more paint than a flat does. They also hold up better over time. So these are bristle brushes. Most of the brushes I have here are from, um, from Rosemary and Company. Some of them are from Richeson. Uh, Richeson makes some great brushes. Um, and then over here, I have... Uh, these are some soft, long flats. Uh, these are a Series 279 from Rosemary that are either made of, if they're older brushes, out of Mongoose, um, or if they're newer, out of Badger hair. And really, these... Um, these are incredibly soft, and I can I can drag them and make broken marks. I can lay down incredibly soft um, application. I can get chisel sharp edges with this, even with a large brush like this. Uh, this is a new brush that they they came out with a couple years ago called an Eclipse Long Comber. Um, it is a synthetic brush that mimics the behavior of the, their older Mongoose two seven nine series brushes. They are a wonderful alternative since there isn't a way to ethically source mongoose anymore. Uh, and then this whole kit of brushes just rolls up and wraps up and stays nice and protected in my pack. I also have some smaller kits that I use when I'm backpacking or if I'm really wanting to travel light. This little box right here is made, made out of a cigar box and I bought hardware and made attachment points for the tripod and I can carry everything that I need as far as the paints and brushes, paper towels, palette knife in this box. That's one thing I didn't mention in the other in the other kit is I always have uh, at least one palette knife for cleaning my palette, mixing paints, and also painting with. Uh, this is a small panel carrier. Right here I this holds three um, six by nine panels which is what I prefer when I'm backpacking or when I'm traveling uh, long distances. So it's, it's a wonderful little setup. Uh, along with this, I will take whatever else I want to amend. The, the, um, a small jar of thinner. Um, all the brushes I said that I need are in here. Some paper towels, um, if, I don't, if I think I'm gonna need more than will fit in this small box. And a tripod, and that's it. And that whole kit, tripod, painting box, panels, and some thinner weighs less than seven pounds and is very compact. It would fit in just a large purse or a shoulder bag or a computer bag, something like that. I hope this little show and tell of my painting kit has been helpful. Uh, if there, you have any questions, feel free to get in touch with me uh, through social media, through my website. Uh, let me know what you think. And if you want, share what uh, your painting kit is. Uh, as a closing, I'll walk you around and let you see some of the field sketches that I've done in various places with this painting setup. Here we have a painting that I did out in Wyoming of some aspens, the hills rising up above. Another small painting of uh, out and done out in Wyoming from life. A lot of my these smaller paintings were done out in Wyoming. This one was done here on Signal Mountain of a beautiful creek. More from Wyoming there and here. This one's, these are tiny, uh, these small square ones. They are just six by six. This is a painting I did up in Wisconsin when I was teaching a workshop for Richardson and Company. And then a couple more from Wyoming. Here's one from the old historic Finley Ranch. Shout out to John Finley, my friend. And uh, this was painted at about 10,500 feet up in the Wyoming Wind River Range. And a few others. A little water and rock study, study done on North Chickamauga Creek here in Tennessee. And another Wyoming Vista. Well, that's it for now. Thank you so much for uh, coming along with this tour of my studio and checking out my painting kit and, uh, and all the things around here. Until next time, I really hope that you have a great time, that you stay safe and healthy during this, uh, this pandemic.
that we're all living through. Uh, my studio is some place that I can come, fortunately, some days when there's no one else in the building and I can still stay um, distant and isolated from other people. Stay, fo stay folks. Thanks so much for watching. Bye.